Hello, everyone, and welcome all around the world to TADWIG 2021 virtual conference. My name is Ellie Wallace, and I work at the Atlas of Living Australia. I'm also the deputy chair of TADWIG. I'm speaking to you from Melbourne in Australia on the lands of the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people, and I pay my respects to them and my respects to any First Nations people joining us today from around the world. This is our second year as a virtual conference and the organising team have been working very hard to bring you this event. This is the very first plenary session for the conference and we will be jumping straight into hearing from our keynote speaker. In the second hour, I'll hand over to the Tadwig Chair, Debbie Paul, for the official welcome. As Avery said, if you need any tech support during the session, we're very grateful that it's being provided by the University of Florida conference team and please don't hesitate to reach out to them. The session's also being recorded for later viewing, and we will aim to have the videos of all the sessions up promptly so that you can catch up during the conference if time zones or other commitments mean that you can't watch live. So please ask questions as Avery suggested using the Q&A feature in Hoover, and these will be asked by the presenters by the co one of the co-moderators. You're also very welcome to use the chat function, but do be aware that we may miss questions if you post them in there. So using the Q&A feature is preferred. And just a reminder that any inappropriate use of the chat may result in you being re removed from the session or from the chat function being disabled. So please see our code of conduct document for more information. As this is our very first session of the conference, please bear with us if uh, any technical difficulties with our new platform arise. And we really hope that you enjoyed the session. And it's now my very great pleasure to welcome Alice Rujueza, the Regional Director for Africa for the World Wildlife Fund. Alice joined the World Wildlife Fund in 2019 and in her leadership role aims to shape the sustainability agenda for Africa in line with the WWF's global conservation priorities. Alice has expertise in capacity building, engaging communities and Indigenous peoples, and sustainable management of ecosystems, goods and services. And we're absolutely delighted that Alice has been able to join us to present her talk, Data for Good, Using Data and Technology to Achieve Conservation and Development Impact. Please join me, even though it's silently, in warmly welcoming Alice Rujueza. Alice, over to you. Thank you so much. I'm very pleased to be here. It is a pleasure to address uh, you today. Uh, I am not a data scientist, as you have heard in my experience, but I'm definitely one of your clients. I'm a user of your data. And so a lot of my, my perspectives probably come from being a user. But uh, prior to joining uh, WWF, I actually worked for Conservation International, where I was leading one of, a, one of their data initiatives called Vital Science. And that really gave me exposure to data and the power of data and the power of being able to really use data uh, to support uh, policy making and obviously the, the benefits, but also the challenges. And some of those actually come from my experience in that. So I will share some of my slides here. Great, I need to, I need to go back to the beginning. All right, can you see them? Yep, that looks great. Great. So um, I think three points that I'll be making today, I will summarize them. So one uh, really is that, um, ever since the data revolution started to make make its way make its way to the mainstream um since around 2013 until now we are see, we've seen a lot of exciting developments around data and technology for conservation and development and other sectors so that is happening there's a lot happening a lot of positive results but of course my second point will be that there are still some challenges there are still some challenges getting to where we need to get to and I'll talk a little bit about those. And then really the last one will be about then some kind of thoughts and recommendations on how we can work together. And particularly, I think for me, the big point is going to be how can we connect the world of data science, the world where you spend your time, you know, collecting data and curating data and all of that with the world where I am, which is the world and policymaking and a world of 
you know, pushing for action on the ground for better conservation and development impact. So yeah, there are the data revolution origins. I think it first came from the high level panel appointed by the UN Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon, way back in, uh, in 2015, uh, where the report really talked about the need for better data and statistics to help governments track progress and make sure that decisions are evidence-based, but also to strengthen accountability. And uh, as you can imagine until then, and, and even now, a lot of policy making and policy decisions are not always based on data for for many reasons some of those so some of which are going to be the challenges some of them are really just the disconnect between the two fields but some of them are also timing some of them are also nature of the data and all of that but uh the really the high level panel noted that we needed this and it wasn't wasn't just about governments and international agencies and cso's and the private sector should also be involved so we needed a whole of society approach towards this and a true data revolution would draw on existing and new sources of data to really integrate statistics into decision making so that was back then um all right good and they defined the data revolution really as transformative actions needed to respond to the demands of a complex development agenda uh, improvements on how data is used and closing the data gaps to prevent discrimination and to build capacity. Same, same, same stuff as, as that, but mostly um, recognizing then as we were getting out of the Millennium Development Goals, we were starting to move into the Sustainable Development Goals and we really, we really needed this. And we also needed the data science that would enable countries to utilize modern methods when you talk about machine learning and distributed data processing and all of that, social media, mobile phone, Internet of Things, ETC, ETC, all those back then were just starting and have now really grown. Um, even here in Africa, we had our own Africa data revolution. We, we developed, they developed something called the Africa data consensus, really pushing for a sustained data revolution that would drive social, economic and structural transformation in every African country. And that would make it easier to track the country's progress towards meeting nationally and globally agreed goals and especially with a view to leave no one behind and recognizing that we had the building blocks in national statistics institutions so but we but also knowing that the development challenges required a broader data ecosystem so there's a whole history in this there's a whole revolution that led us really to where we are and i wanted to just situate this in there so as i've said since then lots of things happening it was very difficult for me to choose what examples to use today because I, I mean there's just so much happening so I know I will have left some out but lots of good ones that I thought I would talk about and really starting of course with the SDGs the sustainable development goals as you know in 2015 and that we are following until 2030 really being able to build a huge database like this I got this from our world in data showing all the data sets that are available and this was big because uh, this is where you had at least 232 indicators and I don't know, 100 and something targets and really uh, government governments needing to track progress. So this is the first time you start to see that broad, broad ecosystem. Um, we ourselves here at WWF developed something we called the African Ecological Futures Platform. And the importance of this for me was about how you bring together various data sets and, uh, and really start to look at environmental pressures and identify emerging scenarios on in ver using various overlaying various sources of data and guiding a government in a process that examines the social economic and environmental implica implications of their decisions so you see here that we have infrastructure we have roads shipping we are looking at zones we're looking at protected areas really understanding if you're going to construct a road where is it going to pass if you're going to build a dam where is it going to pass where are those protected areas where are those community lands um the start of a process of looking at a platform that actually brings several uh, data together, but also allows allows policymakers to look at these overlaps and trade-offs as they make decisions. A similar one here is that another one that we developed, the planet-based diets. This came from an assessment uh, that uh, we carried out last year uh, on how dietary shifts in 147 countries could bend the curve on the negative impacts that the food system has on nature and so here you go into the database like this and you can look at 
various countries and and uh, click on various diets and understand if if my country chose a plant-based diet this is the kind of environmental impact i would have if they chose a uh, meat-based diet this is what they would have or if it would be a mixer of the two so it's more like an ac- impact and action calculator but again using uh, data and also guiding decisions the water risk filter is another example of that again we de- we designed that to it's a practical online tool that helps companies and investors assess and respond to water related risks facing their operations and investments around the globe again using assessing water risks using state of the art data Vital Science, I mentioned this earlier, it was a program that I used to run when I was at Conservation International about three, four, four, five years ago. This was also very groundbreaking in its time because it came in to guide a lot of the funding that was coming through to support African agriculture. There was really a need for an agricultural revolution in Africa, and but, but recognizing also that the yields were low and the need to boost those yields, the need to uh, bring in fertilizers and seeds and others, but but the, the, this the vital science came in to say that okay we understand the fact that we need to do that, but we also need to show you what kind of trade offs the trade offs would look like, and both on the social economic side but also on the environmental side. So we would look at household you know education level, household income levels. We would look at nutrition levels, and then we would juxtapose that with the uh, biophysical data and look at the various protected areas and then really try to come up with a picture of where are the best places for investments for agriculture to go that would not result into imp- by impacts on the environment and impacts on also on the socioeconomic development of the people. Hella Farmers is, does a similar thing but this one works more at a very very local level. Uh, it supports um, ultra poor smallholder farmers surviving on less than a dollar 25 a day living off barren land in the coastal regions in kenya for example and since its launch at least twelve thousand people have been benefiting from advice on how on on, on 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 an app it's an app that comes gives to farmers and supports them on their agricultural practices so we move from vital science which was a bigger one supporting donors and guiding agricultural investments to a smaller one that is supporting farmers and there are many more like this soil apps and others i didn't get into all of those i want i threw in this one the kenya's natural capital biodiversity atlas uh, uh, a tracking this was developed by the africa conservation center uh lucy i know i know will be here and will speak later uh it brought together national agencies universities non-government organizations and academic institutions to create a detailed assessment of kenya's biodiversity one of the first ones that had actually been done although a few more now have also happening but it's it is important because it assembled scattered data sets that exist across various institutions into a common integrated biodiversity database so very very useful for you for for policy makers on health in particular we have drones that I, i'm sure i'm sure you've heard about this uh, one of the best examples i mean there's so many examples of, of drones being used to collect data but I, the one i picked out was the one in um in Rwanda called Zipline that you may have heard about. Uh, Zipline is arguably one of the largest drone delivery, sub- drone delivery for medical supplies. Started in 2014, tackling the geographical challenges of delivering medical supplies quicker and on time. Uh, Rwanda makes between 50 to 150 emergency flights per day to 12 health facilities. So this is amazing. And the orders arrive roughly 30 minutes or less. So over the past years, this has led to a delivery of millions of units of blood, medical products, and vaccines, and saved countless lives. And we know that drones are not going to replace the need for roads and bridges, but they do present a unique opportunity to connect communities that are hard to reach with ground transport. And they've proven to help reduce, you know, stalkouts and overordering and others. Another good example, which is also health related, which I also found very interesting there. Is called Uafia. It is a digital de- behavior change platform which empowers over 10,000 mothers across Kenya to improve their own, their family's health and wellness outcomes. And this is very good. It's a, it's a platform that encourages women to connect with peers and engage with learning content and, and really has been a benefit, but, but particularly encouraging women to use 
uh, both antenatal and postnatal health services and providing uh, incentives for that. So that has been really groundbreaking as well. Elephants, of course, there's a lot on the wildlife side. I mean, I saw shark fins, I saw ele fingerprinting elephants. The example here that I give, I'm giving you is around fingerprinting elephants, which really was put there because to, to fight poaching. And uh, collaboration with the University of Washington, forensic researchers using elephant um, data and DNA to help in poaching of ivory. The DNA sample, samples seized from seized ivory are compared with the DNA data that's already on fire. And the scientists and governments and conservationists are, are able to know which country the, this elephant that has been poached lived and died. And it is having an effect in, in particularly in supporting the fight against poaching and directing people to where the poaching is happening and where it's taking place. So that was fingerprinting elephants. Citizen science, I, I think I wouldn't leave without talking about citizen science because there's been this growth of uh, citizen science and the growth of, of data that is crowdsourced, which is really, really amazing because it's no longer just now about technology and that is also about people and their mobile phones and the kind of data that they can collect. A good example is here, the open street map that you may have heard about, uh, a digital map database of the world built through crowdsourced volunteered geographical information. Um, very important, it, it started out as building the free geographic database of the world and its goal is to eventually have a record of every single geographic feature on the planet. It started out by mapping streets, but it's already gone far beyond to include footpaths, buildings, waterways, pipelines, woodland, beaches, possible, and even individual trees. It's really amazing work that you see uh, on this data revolution in action. And of course, data for social good. On this one, the one example that I had was on education. I like this one very much. The unlocking talent through technology. We've seen a lot of excellent examples on this. And I think the power on this one is the one around, you know, teaching at the right level, recognizing that children do not have the same levels of learning and, and they learn at different levels. And so really through machine learning and all of that, building some algorithms that are able to assess each student's ability to learn and then, and then deliver education to them at the level at which they learn and to take away you know, those learning losses. Lots of great examples here in Kenya. We have a math whiz that does the same one. And Malawi has a similar one I've seen and many, many others on teaching at the right level and others that are unlocking this education through talent, through technology. And this is one example of ours. This is around using social media and Google. This was one that we, WWF, did with The Economist, just trying to measure awareness, engagement and action for nature. And we were trying to understand what is the sentiment out there around nature? What is out, what are people saying? And so we did a whole study using Twitter and Google, working with the Economist Intelligence News and others, just seeing what are people saying? And you could see an inc several increases in uh, more understanding, more awareness and more engagement around issues with nature, which was important for us also to guide our own, our own work and in, in, in engaging the wider society around the issues that we work on. So lots and lots of exciting and groundbreaking challenges. I could have gone on forever. I'm sure there's so many I haven't uh, talked about, but there are many, many amazing, um, amazing uh, uh, data and technology ideas out there. But um, as I said earlier, the second point really is to talk about the fact that there are still a lot of challenges with this. And for me, the first one is to get to scale. So all of these examples I've just given you, um, most of them, maybe not all of them, but most of them are working at certain scales, either at a certain community level, a certain local level, at a certain national level, um, but maybe not yet at a level where everybody is using it. Everybody is taking advantage of it and everybody is using it. And so one of the challenges I think for us that we need to think about going forward is how can we build that um, data revolution or that system that ensures that data revolution reaches everybody and leaves no one behind as the UN high level panel was looking for. So I think that that is one of our one of our major challenges. And the second one which is probably related to the first is really the uptake into policy making. You know, how is all of this data leading to the action at the at the level where it's needed and to have the impact where it's needed? We've seen definitely seeing some impact, impacting some communities, impacting some numbers of people, impacting some places. But how can we get to how can we get 
the desired action. When As we are about to go into 2030, between now and 2030, we've set very lofty goals in the world of, of, of particularly in the world of nature. You know, we need to be net, net zero by, um, by 2030. Uh, we need to be nature positive by 2050. In order to achieve that, we need to be seeing more action. And so how can this data revolution really get us to that action? And what that means, we need to remove this disconnect between where the, the data is being collected and designed and where the policy making is happening and by understanding better what questions do policy makers have and if policy makers are not asking the questions then how can we get them to ask the questions so that our data is more focused capacity and expertise is a big one uh, i have to say most of the examples i see out there some i mentioned and some i didn't mention today are really universities in the north are partnering with uh, various communities in the south, which is great, great partnerships, but we need to also build more and more, I think, local capacity and expertise to generate some of this data. It might also help with number two, where if it's generated locally, it can actually fit better in, into policy making or maybe understands better than policy making arena. The harmonization, interoperability, those big ones, you know, when you bring in the data from various sources, how does it work together? How does it fit together? gaps in what we know uh data may be out of date not available when needed some miss some data some missing people we've seen a lot of that the invisibility issue some some data is not collected maybe they can't reach you maybe you're in the remotest place maybe you're you know the last mile inequality gaps gaps of course in information and who has and who doesn't standards more open standards some some data is available but it's not open how many times do you try to read a document and you have to pay for it how many of those journals and you have to pay that is a that is a big big issue so open access as well and i know that you work on standards which is great to make this so that's a that's a one that you are already tackle, tackling and the sheer number and seemingly competing data sources and indicators so that's another chart so on the one hand you don't have it but on the other hand you have too much how do you decide which one is useful and which one is not so those are some of the challenges that i'm seeing that i think you can discuss really at this were at this workshop to start to think about how to address. And um, I just have a few recommendations and they're not, they're not fully, they're not, um, I wouldn't say they're comprehensive, but I would say that some of them um, can, can come in. So partnerships, of course, uh, local, national, global, public, private, all of this, our whole of society, those partnerships, some of them are starting. I mean, some of them need to continue. Uh, capacity, technical, financial capacity. Cost co collecting data is very expensive. We know that. I saw that when we were doing our vital science work as well. Uh, we tried. We were, we were collecting data at household level, collecting data everywhere, and so being able to reach those last miles requires money. So we need investments, and we know our governments are not sometimes investing as much into this, and so we need to get get them more to invest in this. Connecting data to the questions. I mentioned that already. Supporting that. Supporting a more synergistic and systemic framing and thinking about development programs and integrated planning. I, I gave an example of that with the Africa Ecological Futures and the Vital Science. Both, both programs were very much interested in linking the socioeconomic data to the environmental data and to the biophysical. They were not only looking at one set of data and using that, but they were saying, how do you overlay uh, the levels of nutrition, the access to markets, the population level, the household income? How do you overlay that with uh, um, all the data around where, where the protected areas are and and, poverty and all of that. So I think more and more that that helps if you're doing that, then to have a more more system systems thinking approach around the problems, but also the bet number five, which is the better understanding of the trade-offs and the core benefits. And, and if you are able to measure those and understand them, then you want, you will be able to understand some actions that could address multiple challenges simultaneously rather than only when you do one side of things and you miss out on the other. So for me, you know, the partnerships, the financial capacity, the relevance, but also the integration and the better, the more systems, bringing more systems thinking in the way that we collect data so that we can look at those interrelationships and the complementarities and the trade-offs so that we can actually make better decisions. So at the end of the day, we're looking for data to have better decisions and to have better impact. Thank you very much. over to you. Thank you very much, Alice. That was such an amazing whirlwind um, 
I've so many things to think about and so many things to go back and um, look up. I could I could barely keep up with writing um, writing down all the things that I want to go and look up afterwards. <laughs> so so that was uh, thank you so much. That was absolutely um, absolutely fantastic. Um, so we will start taking questions uh, if people would like to start putting questions into either the Q&A or I think the uh, chat is being monitored as well. Um, I can't see any questions yet, but someone, one of the co-moderators could um, ping me if there are any. In the absence of a question, um, I, I'll start, I've got one, which is this, this question that you pose about how do we get the people creating the data um, and the policy makers, how do we connect up the, 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 um, the people making the policy and what questions they want answers to with the people creating the data? It just seems to be a problem absolutely everywhere. Um, have you got any thoughts? You know, uh, yeah, I, and I'm, I, I'm sure some people in that is, I have thoughts, I think for me, is one of the thoughts that I have and what I saw also and something that I I did during is to start with a to to maybe design our research with a question in mind um, so that it's not top down but it's actually targeted it's targeted to answer a specific question um, and so one of the challenge one of the things I did with, when I was he, he leading the vital science program which was an amazing program you know very a uh, groundbreaking partnership between various universities and and algorithms you know and all of that one of the things was to was to think about so when i came in was to think about how can we how can this how can policymakers use this data mm. and in many ways we we'd already developed the data set so we had it we and we developed it based on what we saw were the big challenges happening at the time in terms of the the, the high footprint that environment the envir high, high environmental footprint on agriculture and being able to balance the need for for gov for for uh, increasing yields, but also ensuring that you do not impact. So one of the things um, was to go and understand, really go down to the national level and understand what kind of uh, challenges, what kind of interested data challenges they were having. And one of the ones we found, the low hanging fruit, the first one was around soil. It was really around governments wanting to zone, to do agriculture zoning and to, and to say, oh, where are the best places for bins if we want to if we're gonna so is this is this where is the best soil that is more suitable for bins please for for all crops so you do crop suitability so we did some crop suitability maps and that was very good because that governments at the time uh, uh some of them hadn't updated their soil maps since the 1970s so it was good to have an updated soil map and and have a good understanding of that but also bringing in um other data so i think to me uh addressing something like an agricultural zoning need was important but again we came at it from the top and i would encourage us to think about coming at it from the bottom i would say trying to understand the user needs and then designing the research or the data collection or whatever ta targeted to that because i think if you do that then you can go straight into that the, the that policy uh, action and impact that we are looking for, because I think most of the time we are retrofitting. We are retrofitting the data that already exists to the questions that may exist or may not exist, or we are creating some questions. And in, it's, sometimes it's useful. Um, sometimes that is useful, but I don't think it gets you to scale. I think it gets you to scale if you have a better and targeted research towards a, a, a need that a government is trying to resolve or a policymaker is trying to resolve. And I think the best way to do that is to engage with the policymakers to, to remove that disconnect between the science and the policy making. Thank you. We do have a couple of uh, questions that have come in. Um, the first one is, um, who are the people who can help us with your recommendation number five about how to address multiple challenges simultaneously? <laughs> Oh, um, so I think, interestingly, I don't think I, I don't think it's about who the people, it's about the partnerships, isn't it? So we know that out there you have a group of people who are collecting data on science, oh, sorry, on climate. Then you also have out there some people who are collecting data on water and the various things that water does. You have people collecting data on nutrition. You have people collecting data on human health. Uh, and, and really, if you think about that, inter that, that all of these issues are related. Think about the SDG uh, 17 goals and how they were set up to be to work together simultaneously. 
it means that you need to bring those people together and bring them together in one platform. So almost like we talked about uh, the, the Vital Science platform as an mm -hmm. example of that, uh, the um, the Africa Ecological Futures is one where we try to do some of that, but we're not doing all of it. But I think more and more, it's, I think for me it's about bringing, building a platform that allows you to bring all of these data sets together. Our, our platform had data set from household surveys, it mm -hmm. had data sets from from satellites, so it had satellite data. It had uh, data from soil, so from soil, soil data. It had mm -hmm. uh, household data, and you could still put it on that platform. You could still pick from it, and and uh, and generate something with it. And so it's it's not completely. Um, I think it's it's not about that. These specific people. My, I think what it is is how you bring all of these different data sets together to tell you one complete story. And I think for me, it's important. This is important, especially when you're talking about moving the needle and creating a difference is you must bring break down these silos and bring this data together to understand the trade-offs to understand the synergies all of that i think to me is the biggest place where we still have to do some work and we're still not doing as much as needed thank you there's a there's a um a related question uh about which is related to what you've just said about partnerships uh, so to what extent do we do you think we need the data connections and interlinkages between the data data platforms? Should we be concentrating there or uh, do you think that we should be concentrating more on on the partnerships between people? I think both, both. both. <laughs> yeah, both. The partnerships between people are important, but then if you're going to bring the data together to give you the complete story, then you are going to have to work on interoperability and harmonization because how else are you going to 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 pull it put it on one platform so you need both you need the partnerships but you also need to look at the uh, uh at least to make it faster if you're going to use machine learning to do something like this it needs to be interoperable if you're just going to bring people in a room to talk together and uh, just share their data i i think we're moving more towards the machine machine learning area and the artificial intelligence a space where you bring these together and you create these algorithms and they tell you i think i think both i think both are important even bringing people in a room together to talk is also important um <laughs> so it might be it might actually be where you pursue both and you see how they take you yeah and aren't we all looking forward to actually being able to be in a room together again <laughs> that would yes. be yes, yes that would be delightful that would be fantastic um there's a question here about the the problem of um what's been called tech solutionism. So we're often, oftentimes we look for the technical and the data solutions, but ignore the structural and social issues. Um, so are there any suggestions on how to not just think about the technical solutions to what might be a, a social problem? Yes, now that's, a, that, that's true. That's a very good question. And it's related, I think, to what you said, which we said earlier, where sometimes it may require to bring people in a room rather than just the machine learning things. And I agree, I, I absolutely agree that um, we need to balance. I mean, some of these issues are, are are not going to have a technical solution. Some of them are going to require a conversation solution, a community gathering solution. And those things are still important. The, being, the things that bring people together, the, the, the spaces where people still gather and have these women groups and, and others and, and create their solutions are, are also important. And linking them to technology is fine. I mean, there's a lot of link of links to mobile apps now and, and the proliferation of mobile technology, at least what I see here in Africa, is we are doing still doing both, where you still have women communities learning together uh, uh, and, and doing that. So I agree. I think we need to balance the, the, the desire to use technology and make things faster and make things tell us what we need at a faster rate to also the other one where sometimes the solutions are, are slower sometimes they're rooted in just people talking together and caring with each other that's important that's also important mm -hmm. yes yep uh, there's a question um up here which is um can you tell us more about open street map are there uh ngos championing championing open street map or is it um, still more of a grassroots project I do not. So one of the things I would say, what I know, I'll tell you what I know about OpenStreetMap, which is what I told you about. But uh, I, um, I think I would encourage you to read OpenStreetMap. I think it's OpenStreetMap.org or something like that. Um, I think it's being championed at different levels, even at government level now, by the way. 
I think that that data that they've managed to crowdsource and use is being used. I've seen it used in disaster risk reduction. I've seen it used in health. I've seen it used in other places. So if the question, I think it's being championed at different, very many different levels. Uh, and I would say, I would say it would be worth looking at the at that database, at that um, at the, at the, at their website to see, because I've seen the humanitarian open street map working on disaster risk reduction. Mm -hmm. I've seen, of course, the one that uh, we've used, and the fact that it's map, it's really creating a whole, uh, you know, footpaths, buildings, waterways, pipelines. So it's it's, it's a lot of use for this in this on the social side, and also on on on, on our environmental side, especially. So I would say it's being championed quite a bit, also at government level. And um, uh, I don't have all the information. I would encourage you to read more. But yes, I see it's been very since it started. It's got over two million, I think, users and others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's grown. Yeah. yeah. Um, going back to policymakers, um, the question is that policymakers are keen to pay for the synthesis and analysis of data, but are less less keen to pay for the creation of data sets. So, in an open data, open access world, which we all support, there's a risk that the true value of the data is lost. How can we better articulate the value of the data that's being gathered encourage, to encourage those that need data to help pay to create that data? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, very good point. But uh, you know what? I think the value is in the answer that I'm looking for. If I am a policymaker, the value of that data is in the solution that I can get out of it. If, you, if I'm looking for... Um, uh, traditionally, uh, I would say, especially in developing countries, we probably do not have a readiness to pay for this anyway. It's not there. Uh, we have our national statistical agencies collecting data that, uh, you know, households, annual household surveys and others that, you know, is collected and is used. And that, that's, that's a service that they are already set up to do because they're a government agency. But then there's all this other data that is collected on the side, which is some of the, the best ones that we were talking about. Um, you know, like planet, like the satellite maps that people find, like the yield data. I mean, there's amazing data that comes out there and it's expensive. And I think the best way for people to get people to pay for it is to make sure that you're answering the question they're looking for. Otherwise, I think it's extremely difficult uh, because the resources are not there. The resources yeah. now are going to fighting COVID-19, <laughs> you know, <laughs> for now the data that's probably going to be useful is the data that is going to help us resolve that issue at the moment. So I think, I think, it, I think for me, um, you have, you have to give, you have to look at the user, you have to focus on the data that provides a solution to a problem that somebody is needs. There you can start to look at that. That is the value. That is the value yes. of that data. It's not just the data itself. The value is in the solution to the problem that is sitting on, on my table at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in the chat, Hank asked um, that or said that he loves the point that you made about the importance of capacity building in data science, um, and he wonders if you could tell us about WWF's capacity building efforts in African ecological futures. Yes, so the African Ecological Futures, um, when we started that, it was really about, it's first and foremost, it was, it's a partnership that we have with the African Development Bank. Uh, and uh, at the time, and of course, we have now other partners as well. I think the Africa Conservation Center, Lucy is here. We have UNEP, we have others, others as well, I should point out. But at the beginning, when we first started, it was the recognition that there was a lot of investment coming into planned and, and coming into Africa, whether it was on infrastructure, particularly on infrastructure, um, but also recognizing, and this is important because the infrastructure gap is big and Africa needs to grow and Africa needs to industrialize and Africa needs to harness its natural resources sustainably, it needs to create jobs, incomes. I think it's important to understand that, but and, and recognizing that then how is the best way for us to direct this investment so that when it does come in, it comes in, um, and but enables us to still protect some of those last few remaining, uh, whether it's the remaining forests or the remaining wetlands or the remaining others that, that we need to continue to preserve. And that some of this nature depends on, it's a very similar idea that was also with the Vital Science Project, which was really about how do you guide investments? How do you guide financial institutions, investments from financial institutions so that they are 
uh, they are more greener and they are, have a better <laughs> understanding of their impacts. And uh, so the capacity building actually is very much uh, it's on both sides, also on the side of those people who are uh, investing. So people, it's, in, it's on the, the, the private sector, the, the people who design these loans, the people who structure the loans, the people who uh, design these projects really to understand what are the potential impacts that we are going to have. For example, what is the potential impact of a, of a road that is going to go through a national park? How do we, so that, that we can build your capacity in understanding what that means, uh, how many road kills are happening when these cars are going to come through, or potential road kills, what does that mean for, 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 you, for, your, for your investment, how can you make your investment greener, what is the mitigation measure that you can put in place to make sure that, that uh, this doesn't happen, how can you create corridors, how can you create underpasses, there's many places you create underpasses for wildlife or corridors for wildlife so that you can still have the road but you can still also have that all important uh, wildlife corridor. So the, the, there's a, a lot of capacity building in that respect, in the in the in the better understanding of the impacts mm -hmm. of your work. There is uh, the environmental, social, and social safeguards that you need to put in place. So the under that, the mitigation measures that you need to put in place, and uh, and the tracking of those mitigation measures to make sure that they are working. Yeah. So we're likely to have quite a few. Um... Uh, young or early career researchers uh, joining us on the call today. I just wonder if you um, if you have any thoughts about um, if they're interested in in policy making, if they're interested in being part of an NGO, for example. Um, do you have any uh, thoughts or suggestions for um, how they might um, how they might uh, pursue their interests? <laughs> Good. I think they should. I think they should go on the ground. They should go on the ground. They should go to some the local municipality or the district or the local community. Sit down with them, listening a little. Listen to them. Listen. I. I. I actually. I really think that our young career researchers and our young people uh, benefit more from understanding context, understanding the local context, and having a good appreciation of the challenges that are on the ground that people face. And, and really coming at this from that side, uh, because it's very easy to sit down and say, oh, I want to run, I want to do this exciting project, I want to do this exciting idea, I want to build this thing. Um, and sometimes if you build it, they will come, but sometimes I think it will, it will be even better if you build it from an understanding of where the issues are. And most of the time, anyway, one of some of the challenges, and I don't, I don't remember if I talked about this earlier, but it's also the format in which you do. I remember when we did the soil maps, I, I talked about for the national level, I remember going to one district and a district person said, unless you do for me the soil map for my district, I, I, UA national level one doesn't mean a lot to me. So I think it's also in terms of understanding these issues from the perspective of the place, you know, place-based, place-based solutions, actually. So place-based uh, research that answers place-based questions and uh, that is could be relevant to place-based issues and place-based challenges is important. So I would encourage young researchers to spend some time in so many different places and understanding these local contexts and the questions will be different where where you mm -hmm. go everywhere you go yeah so so really understanding that yeah. um that's terrific now we do um you've mentioned a few times and i know that we do have lucy um warungi yeah. here uh, on the call um lucy um alice spoke about kenya's natural capital um, and uh, so, sorry, I should introduce Lucy is the executive director of the African Conservation Centre, who is hiding in there. Lucy, I wonder if you would like to come off mute and make um, and say hello and um, provide us with a few um, comments and some reflections. Okay, thank you, Ellie, and thank you, Alice, for a very broad presentation, but which poses very pertinent questions. I'm very happy to be here. Tadric is part of a movement I believe in and have participated for many years. And I'm glad we're able to do it uh, online, notwithstanding the limitations of meeting physically. Um, and perhaps all I'll do is emphasize one or two points that um, in terms of context that Alice has raised that I think are absolutely important. Having been now in a space of trying to work with policymakers and data and coming to the sad realization that even the biodiversity atlas commissioned by the minister, launched by the minister. No one in the ministry even ever asks about it once it was launched. <laughs> so you almost think that, you know, they're cheering that this needs to be done, 
but it is very clear they have not thought through why they want this done. Other than, yes, it's a good piece of work, but how will they use it? And so one of the things we've really been struggling with is how to reduce that space between those of us passionate and interested in producing data that should support decision making, but the waning and sometimes inconsistent uh, interest from the decision makers who most times have a political framing in terms of their positions and their interests. How do we reduce that gap? Otherwise we will keep producing products that actually never get utilized. And I think one of the things that um, I'm, I'm, I've been, we've been grappling with and finding perhaps more uh, useful in, in, is looking at wh whose question are we answering at which scale? So for example, the Biodiversity Atlas is a great national product, but those questions are critical. The answers provided in that atlas are critical to a lower scale of the, of the, of the people who are planning on land use, on people who are debating what to convert, what is the priority zoning for a particular area or not. And so to think about, we provided a product that's national. It therefore has a national scale, but the people who really, really need this most of the time are the practitioners on the ground working at a lower scale. So how do we ensure that our products are not answering the right question for the wrong audience or are not targeting the right audience, but with the wrong answers? So it's really been a, um, so right now, one of the things we are doing is to cascade down that national product to the county level and say, does this help you? And what's missing that we can add at your level, which will interface with what we produce nationally to give you a planning tool and an implementation tool you can use. And we're getting a bit more traction because then we are talking to the people who are having to deal with the decisions daily. But that's been one of sort of the realizations. I think the other one I would, um, highlight is communication. I think uh, when we did the Atlas, we then wanted to make it available uh, nationally. So we embarked on a project of having an online portal that contains all those data sets. Uh, but we found that how do you communicate technical language? Yes, we have pictures of birds, of amphibians, of reptiles. We have data, we have taxonomic namings and what's available where. But we found that until we got on social media, and actually had to hire a social media company to put out messages three times a week on what the Atlas has. And do you know this tortoise is in your county? Go to the Atlas and find out where it's found. That changed the visibility and the interest. And most of our projects don't have that drawn in when you're thinking of research and data collection and biodiversity uh, knowledge uh, products. And so for me, that's been a takeaway also. How much are we investing in producing products that are consumable in the new space, that the new space needs less words, more pictures, you know, and it's more of a blurb than the story, but hopefully that the blurb gets them to the real story. Um, so I think there's a piece on communication that we really need to think through a bit harder, uh, but in the policy interface, really providing answers at the right scale, even though all data is good, but I think in many times it has not been, um, appropriately packaged for the people who need it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ellie. Thank you so much, Lucy. Alice, any thoughts in response? Perfect. No, really, I think she, <laughs> Lucy pretty much highlighted exactly what I was saying, you know, uh, uh, that are appropriately packaged for the scale that is needed. I, g I gave you that example of the district person who said the soil map is great, but is it from my district, you know? Uh, that really is important and, and uh, the communicating, I mean, the policy interface is exactly that. And um, the communication, I, I, I think that is a very good one, Lucy, the social media. And, you know, being able to say that this tortoise is in your district, go and look it up. That, that, that is very powerful because then people relate. They relate with that. That's, what I was, that's why I was saying that your young researchers should think about how you can put that, capture that emotion. How do you get that emotional attachment to the research that you're doing? You get the emotional attachment to your research, to your data, by making it relevant to the person who needs it. it and the person who's dealing with the questions every day, as Lucy has said, there you finally start to get traction because yes, I have this question, I wanted it. I'm looking for this data because I need to make this decision. I'm struggling. You need that, you need to know that and you need to know where that is and then you need to provide the solution for that. Yeah. Thank you. 
So we have a question which, which um, I, I think uh, you don't have to pick one answer. I think you, uh, you're very welcome to say all three, um, which is, do you feel like the bottleneck on environmental action, so, so action rather than policy making, lies with um, data problems, too much, too little, not connected enough, not open enough, or two, lack of interest or understanding among policy makers and politicians, or three, lack of awareness or maybe lack of urgency among members of the public. Mm. <laughs> mm. Who wants to go first? So the lack of action. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I will go give it a go, and then Lucy, you should also give it a go. Um, I think all those three actually. So I think there's. Um, uh, so there's, there's there may be the lack of action. The lack of action could be lack of awareness and urgency, um, and lack of political will, of course. Um, and so there's, there's the, the case of you know maybe you don't know what needs to be done, but there's also the case of um, just politically you know that's not where my interest is right now. That's not where what I should be doing. My interest is in something else. I need to get votes tomorrow. That my voters care about ABCD, and you're asking me to do E. He is not of a sense of urgency for me at the moment, um, so that, that that's that, that's why you have to capture those those sentiments are important. You have to have that both the awareness part, but also the the import the urgency and and the importance. Um, yeah, um, funding funding could be an issue as well. You may be asking <laughs> us to do something that is prohibitively expensive. Um, so I think that those three are in there. But Lucy, you may have more from your work on the ground. <laughs> Thank you, Alice. I would agree they are all three important, but I'd like to add a twist to one and also add a fourth one. Yeah. <laughs> and um, on the one of little data, it's back to whether we have packaged information in a way people can use it. I know for a long time there was, we don't have enough information, let's keep collecting data. And that has its value, but it's quick. we're quickly also knowing that even the data we have, no one's using it mm -hmm. for the hope that it could be used in. So how do we get more usability? Even as we, yes, it's a dark continent in terms of data in Africa and we need to get more data, but what about what we have? How do we get that more visible? So I still feel there's a bit of effort needed on the visibility of what we already have. But here is the fourth one I want to add in addition to poor policy action and poor awareness is I don't think people know the cost of inaction. If we don't act on the data we have, is there a consequence? So I think we as data providers need to start having scenarios where we are saying, okay, this is the trajectory of the decline of this or the increase of this level of pollution or the decrease of space for a certain species or the fragmentation of a certain habitat. But so what? Most people don't really think that affects the next thing, whether it affects water provision or affects um, pollination of plants for agriculture, or it affects ABCD. So I think if we can, because we're now in the big data, and as Alice said, you know, with all the automation, we can do amazing models, but hopefully simplify them. I think we need to do a lot more on scenario projections with the data we have, that people can see this will be the cost of inaction. It doesn't look like it's a big deal now, but we're continuing this trajectory of business as usual. Here is the outcome for either your productivity or your social, uh, your ability to socially place people in places to live, if places get flooded or degradation increases, or here is the loss of bees and what that means for your pollination for honey, which is now, you know, a big consumer product. So I think we, if we got people in scenario projection with the data we have, we can get them to envisage what the worst future could be and perhaps also envisage imagination of what's the future we want. And how can data help us imagine that future? Yeah, thank you. I'd also now just like to bring in Hank Bart. Um, Hank is a professor in the Tulane uh, De Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology and um, director of the Tulane Biodiversity Research Institute, who's also been thinking um, uh, about this issue um, the, that we haven't talked about so much yet about decolonizing museum data. Um, and so, Hank, I wonder if you would like to share your reflections. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, Ellie, and thanks so much, Alice, for a wonderful presentation. So, yeah, I'd like to make a few uh, points about some work uh, in Kenya, actually, when we were doing surveys uh, there to document fish diversity in the country. Um, and this kind of 
em emphasizes the point that Alice made about disconnects, you know, among the data that we have. So there's uh, Kenya's largest river is the Tana River, a mighty river that originates up in the region around uh, Mount Kenya and the Abadares Range and flows all the way to the Indian Ocean. And uh, at the time we were working there, there were five dams uh, on the Tana. Uh, another one was being built and there was a seventh one uh, that was being planned. And um, there was, you know, all this information about the importance of those dams to hydropower, to, uh, you know, uh, Kenya's energy independence. But there wasn't a very good understanding of how the dams on the Tana starved water from the Delta, which, you know, is a very important biodiversity reserve. Uh, it supports the lives of, of uh, migratory uh, uh, herders who would, who would bring their cattle there to, gauge, uh, to graze, fishermen who are using the river as a source of food, you know, flood recession, agriculture. So, you know, it, it, this is, brings up the point about uh, the kind of data we have um, in one system like the Tana River, but the data are disconnected. And, you know, how is it that we understand the impacts of uh, things like dam construction on, you know, processes that happen way down river in a delta like in the Tana River. So this was, this was something that was really important. I think that, you know, we have to figure out a way to connect the data we have so that we can better uh, plan for things that are happening um, in, in regions like, uh, like in east, east, uh, Eastern Kenya. Hmm. Alice, have you got a, a thought? We are going to have to say goodbye to Alice quite soon. Um, uh, Alice is in, in demand uh, and has to, uh, has to jump off, um, uh, go straight away, rush to another call. So we've only got Alice's, uh, Alice here with us for another few minutes, um, but um, have you got any thoughts uh, before we say goodbye? <laughs> no, thank you so much. I think it's, a, I think it's an amazingly rich uh, discussion. And uh, I think it, I, I wish I could stay longer because I would want to hear how we tackle those issues around uh, um, how do we bring together these worlds, the two worlds of the, the users and the, the, the researchers. And uh, like I said, the researchers are very interested and in out there developing and designing research that is extremely important and extremely interesting. Uh, but at the same time, on the other side, as Lucy has said, you're failing to see this research get taken into action, into policy making and also action. Of course, policy from policy making comes action. Uh, and, um, and it's important because if we're really going to make that, I think for me, if we're really going to make the change that we need to make and the solutions we need to make between now and 2030, we are going to have to do that. And maybe one last thought I didn't bring up earlier, which is important. I think I, when I talk to people, sometimes they say, you environment, the biggest problem with you environmentalists is because you have this doom and gloom. You're always talking about you're always talking about how the world is about to end on this and on that and on this, and maybe sometimes we need to reframe our our uh, di our uh, narrative into an opportunity. So here it is: we have an opportunity between now and 2030 to do some of the things that we need to do. We have a uh, I, I, where I am. We have a continent that is full of youth. You know, the youngest uh, we have the youngest, the highest number of people that are below the age of 22 or below the age of 35. So there you are. There are opportunities out there. I think there's more awareness around nature and the issues. Like I told you that report we did the Eco Awakening, we found a lot of awareness. There's a better understanding. COVID-19 has woken us up to some of these relationships and what happens when. Uh, and so I think the, the time is now. The time is now. And so let's this let's connect the world of data because we need this world of data and science and technology and everything to the world to action to action on the ground to action where it's needed to impact so that onwards into 2030 we will have achieved those big goals that we set for ourselves thank you very much thank you so much what a wonderfully um inspiring way to to finish um your time with us um so uh, i know we we can't uh we can't clap or uh, say thank you um, by uh, by being loud, but um, we can certainly thank you thank you very much from uh, from all of us on the call. I think there's been about uh, about 170 people who've who've been um, listening, and I'm sure lots of people will uh, listen uh, watch the video afterwards. So. 
Pleasure. Thank you very, thank, thank you, you very much for joining us. Um, I'm going to uh, also thank Lucy and Hank. Now we're going to hear a bit more from Lucy and Hank later on in the session. So um, their, their few minutes uh, was not the only time that we'll have with them. But what I would like to do now is to um, hand over to the Tadwick chair, Debbie Paul, and um, I can see Pam is here too, and Pam doesn't have very much time either. So um, I will, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm now, I'm not entirely sure if I'm handing to Debbie or Pam, but I'm hoping that one of you will take the floor and um, start us off with the opening to the opening. Um, or actually, Avery, can you tell me, do we need to close this session and start a new one? Yeah, so if you are in the Whova app, you wanna go ahead and leave this session and go back under the agenda tab and rejoin via the opening session. So we and might- Deb and uh, Pam, you guys can get us started. Thanks so much, Ellie. Okay, hey, everybody, thanks. I'll start now. I'll share my screen for you, Pam. Great, thanks, Deb. I'd like to just start first by thanking Alice for her inspiring presentation and also thank Ellie and Lucy and Hank for a really stimulating discussion. Do we have the screen yet? Not quite. Ready? Great, thank you. So, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on your time zone, and welcome to TADWIG 2021. I'm Pam Soltis from the University of Florida in Gainesville, Florida in the United States, and I would be your local host if we were actually meeting in person. I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement I'm attending Tadwig from the ancestral homelands of Florida's indigenous peoples, including the Patano and other Tamuqua speakers, as well as numerous other contemporary federally recognized tribes, including the Seminole, and those currently lacking federal recognition as well. We honor the people of this place and their heritage. Now in 2018, during the Tadwig conference in Dunedin, New Zealand, the Tadwig leadership invited the University of Florida to consider hosting the 2020 annual meeting, and we accepted, thinking that it would be a wonderful opportunity to share our biodiversity rich region with colleagues from around the world. We envisioned field trips and excursions to the Gulf of Mexico, to the mangroves and beaches of the Atlantic Ocean, to the freshwater springs and forests of Northern Florida, and more. Well, of course, the pandemic put that vision on hold as Tadwig went virtual last year. But we hoped again that an in-person conference would be possible for 2021. Unfortunately, we're not able to host you in person this year either. But the good news is that we have participants from 47 countries attending this virtual conference this year. And this would not be possible if we were indeed meeting here in Gainesville. Now, a more comprehensive thank you will follow soon from Tadwig Chair Deb Paul, but I'd like to acknowledge several funding sources here at the University of Florida who helped make this conference possible. The UF Biodiversity Institute, the UF Office of Research, the Florida Museum of Natural History, and IDIG Bio, which is funded by the US National Science Foundation. These funds have helped to provide scholarships to our attendees and to cover some of the basic expenses involved in hosting a virtual conference. I'd also like to thank Avery Bender and her team at the UF Conference Department for their excellent logistical support. And now on behalf of my colleagues at the University of Florida, I'd like to welcome you once again to Tadwig 2021. And now I'll turn things over to Tadwig Chair, Deb Paul. Greetings, everyone, and welcome. 
And I'd like to take this opportunity again to say thank you to Alice. Uh, that was a wonderful way to get us started. And for Hank and uh, Lucy for being able to join us and, and share their insights. And I'd like to pause for just a few moments now to say um, I would like to know if they have any thoughts on this topic uh, that we alluded to um, briefly, the decolonization of data specifically, before we dive into the logistics of the meeting. So Hank, um, Lucy, would you, Hank, would you start us off with a brief comments? Yes, can you hear me? We can. Oh, good. Yeah, so very, very important uh, uh, topic. And, you know, it's relevant uh, everywhere, right? I mean, it's, it's something we're talking about in a Kenya context, but um, everywhere there was colonialism, um, you know, there's uh, a big imprint on, on um, the kinds of information that are available, the way that, you know, access to those data are being controlled, the way that they uh, benefit Native peoples, uh, First Nation peoples in the different um, uh, countries around the world. There's a there's a big imprint of colonialism that um, is affecting access to cultural artifacts, um, to you know information about biodiversity, and um, so it's not surprising that there's a big effort underway to try to decolonize um, all of that data and and the practice and the way that the, the information about biodiversity and other kinds of things actually benefits um, traditional people. So um, I, I would like to uh, just point to a couple of examples that are relevant to the museum community because I know a lot of us uh, come from the natural history collections community. So, so Hank, do you have um, some slides you'd like to share? And we can jump to those if you like. I, I don't, I'm sorry. Okay, um, that's okay. But, then we'll just, just do it this way. Talk, just talk through this briefly, yeah. This would be great. And this actually, what the, the point I want to make actually goes back to work that I did in Kenya. That uh, and it and it, it emphasizes this theme I brought up by capacity building, as well. That you know that one one of the things that um, that we did in Kenya with the I, with our international research experiences for students project was we engaged with Kenyans at the at Kenya's National Museum of of um, Kenya and um, uh, in, engage them in the project of all the work that we we're doing. So we we're sampling the streams to get information on the diversity of fishes and other kinds of aquatic organisms in the collection of specimens and in depositing those specimens in the ichthyology collection of the, of the National Museums of Kenya. So, you know, the tradition has always been for the uh, colonial powers to go to these countries, collect specimens, and bring all the specimens back to the home museum and accession them there, uh, limiting access uh, to those specimens and those resources by people in the countries where the, where the uh, specimens were collected. Our approach in IRIS was to deposit all of our specimens in the National Museums of Kenya, um, when we described the species, we uh, deposited the types there as well. And then as researchers, you know, we became associates of the museum so that we could access the specimens when traveling to Kenya and study them. And so it's a very different situation from the situation that we have had in the past you know, where there's very limited engagement of people in the local, in the country where, it's, where the specimens were collected. Um, and, but I think it's a good, and, and, it, and it presents some kind of challenges if you think that, you know, resources in the particular museum might not be the same, the ability to care for the specimens might not be the same, but it's really important that people in these countries where the specimens originate have access to the material for their own training um, for their own study and knowledge. And you know, I just think we need to have um, situations like this where we're sharing, where we're openly sharing material from our work in these foreign countries with people in the countries so that they can 
better take advantage of it. So that's 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 a really important point about um, uh, decolonizing information, but it's also a point about capacity building because you know we were by by depositing all our material in Kenya, we were increasing that capacity to work with these specimens and do the same kind of biodiverse discovery that we were doing. Mm, thanks. So to continue this, Lucy, would you like to add any thoughts to this? Uh, yes, sure, Debbie. And, and uh, thank you again for this opportunity and great to see you. I think the, you know, in addition to the points Hank has raised on practically designing our research work and data collection to include um, the cap building capacity of those locally there who would then remain with the skills and the knowledge. I'd like to also highlight that um, we also need to be thinking through whose information, who owns the information and what type of data and information are we collecting? I think many times scientists have been seen as fly in, collect what you want, fly out, go with what you collected to a point where communities say we are fatigued, we don't want any to be part of any other assessments or research, or two, that this research is of no value to us. And they may mean something different by value, but we haven't been good at doing, giving a value proposition. of Why is this data valuable to them? Even if it's about a species that is you know, ubiquitous in their region and is of interest to a certain scientist, how can we convert the outcomes of what we are researching to be of value to those in whose landscapes we are doing the research. So who owns the data? How is it collected? Engaging the local community in being part of that collecting. How is it disseminated? They do not read peer reviewed journals, but most times, even with the best intentions, we do not really go back and have a proper dissemination engagement and say, here is what we found out. What do you think about it? Do you agree with the findings? Do you have other insights? Some of them have cultural stories and practices and totems around a species we are, we are collecting information on. Do we include that cultural knowledge or historical practice of, of that space or that species into what we are collecting? And in the African Conservation Center, one of the ways we've really tried to uh, really look at indigenous people's engagement and making sure that their stories and the information they find useful is part of what we collect is we've had three pronged approach. One, we've gone in on the ground and said, we have this interest in a research, but what do you want collected? What information would you find useful? And so we do a community needs assessment and to the extent possible without compromising our own research, incorporate their data needs into our research design. And then secondly, we have trained local people to use downscale scientific tools to collect the data themselves. And in one area in Amboseli right now, we've converted the questionnaire into an open data toolkit on a smartphone, because even in the rural areas, they do have smartphones and they collect, the young men collect the data themselves and they become part of the agents feeding back when they go home on what they were collecting, what they're finding. And then thirdly, we have built in two locations in Magadi and in Amboseli, what we call community resource centers where the data we are all collecting sits, where they gather together to interrogate what we are finding and we listen to their input on what they have to say on the same subject matter. And that community resource center is both a place for information archiving, but also a place for dialoguing around the research that's going on in their area. And we have found that that has enabled us to have a bit more traction in, in, in ownership of the data that's being collected and also gives us the expectation that they will expect us to go to the resource centers and provide the information. And in one of them, they're now asking scientists, we are happy for you to come and study here as long as you leave a copy of your research findings at our community resource centers. So we think that investment in helping build these structures that are you know, not brick and mortar in a, in a large sense, but you know, wood and uh, using the local and natural materials, open spaces for meeting, but with basic like solar power, internet connectivity has really added the appreciation of data and information at the community level. And let me say one last one, which is a part of what we've been doing, and you could call it, you know, trying to ensure that data is not just seen as a Western construct that's needed by people who fly in and fly out, is to repackage capacity building to involve the researcher, 
and the landowner on whom the research is, is being undertaken. So we've partnered with a local university called Strathmore University, uh, together with the IFS group, and we put a, a, a proposal for the bid uh, grant, and we got a grant to build capacity of middle level conservationists, but the design of their research must have the endorsement of the leaders in the area they are working, and the training is joint, that you have the researcher coming in for training on how to manage biodiversity information, how to put it up on GBIF, and how to use it for policy making. But sitting with them is the landowner on whose land this research is happening. So he may not be interested or have the capacity to do a whole degree, but he can give input as the researcher continues on the data that is being collected. But secondly, he gets a better appreciation that I'm here managing a conservation area. I'm a high school young man from a Maasai community, but I'm involved in defining the questions this researcher will ask. I'm involved in understanding the findings they have. So even as we get our good piece of work of data being applied in G, updated in GBIF, applied in policy, the landowner who's managing the piece of land is able to be part of that process and interrogate both the process and the product. And all these are in very early stages, um, but we think those efforts that I have outlined there have really helped us reduce the gap between the local indigenous people and the data uh, push and interest of the scientists and conservationists. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I hear that recurring theme of the bridge needed between different communities and their particular needs and the need to potentially adjust one's current standard of practice for one's own needs to include potentially other communities so we can work together. Uh, wow, I, I love that, Lucy. Thank you, personally. Um, Hank, any follow-up thoughts to that? Yes, uh, actually, Lucy's comments reminded me of uh, a time we were visiting a Maasai village in, um, uh, in Masai Mara, and um, I was turning, I was talking to uh, one of the local uh, people who was leading us on a tour of the village, and uh, he was telling us about, you know, the structure of the, of the community, um, the, uh, the way they take care of their cattle and things, and all of a sudden, um, he, uh, there was a buzzing sound coming from his, uh, from his uh, shuka that he had covering him, and he reached in, and he grabbed the cell phone and he pulled it out and he starts talking on the cell phone. Lucy reminded me of the story, <clears throat> you know, how the people, how the cell phone uh, service kind of is reaching out to very re remote parts of, um, of Kenya, you know, and other countries, right? Because of the technology, but they're using this technology in education. In fact, after this person completed his, Moses, his name was, completed his conversation, he started to uh, tell us about how they're using cell phones in education to teach the, the kids, you know, about um, uh, to create um, learning around uh, cell phone technology and where you transmit uh, information using cell phones. And so this is just kind of a, another reminder, you know, of the importance of engaging local communities in the work that we do as scientists, that we, um, that we talk to them we tell them about the work we're doing. We give them an appreciation of the biodiversity you know, that's um, in their very communities. Uh, a lot of times they know uh, things about the biodiversity that would benefit us in our research, but we engage them in this process. They will engage other people from their community in documenting that diversity and, and thereby help us you know, the kind of research that we that we need to do. And then it also gives them, you know, some sense of ownership of the data that we're generating in, in the work that we're doing. So it's, you know, it's something that's mutually beneficial to the science and, you know, to the local people, their appreciation of it and their, their ownership of the work that we're doing. So in the current situation here where I am sharing my screen, I can't see if there are questions. So maybe that someone who can could speak up and let us know. Uh, if there are no questions, I will certainly ask one. 
are there any questions for Hank and Lucy on decolonization of data and the points they've raised? We don't have any questions at the moment. Thanks, Ellie. So I would ask, um, do you, either of you, um, both of you, have specific ideas for, in, in terms of the TADWIG, so for biodiversity information standards and the kind of uh, data needs that we've just hinted at, what are some specific ideas for this group in terms of developing standards and, and helping to get them adopted that members of this group could take on? What actions could you recommend? I don't know who wants to go first. <laughs> I'm going to let Lucy go first. <laughs> <laughs> That's not an easy question, Debbie. And um, because to some extent, you know, the standards already in place have helped us to have more interoperable platforms to know. share data and package data and um, share results. And when you think about these, um, the target group we are discussing when we say decolonizing you know, data and information, they may not necessarily need to utilize data at that level of sophistication, but they are, they definitely shouldn't be ignored in the process and their inputs uh, considered or their data needs considered. So just wondering whether there'd be other ways in time to look at anecdotal information that would bring context, be it cultural, be it practice and, and uses of data and reference to data that are not um, are not, um, what would I say, numeric measurements, but are so important in understanding context, in understanding causes of decline, perhaps in a certain species or in understanding uh, the people's attitudes towards uh, certain species. So for example, we once did an attitudinal survey where we asked Maasai, which species of all mammals do you find most useful? And why is it useful? And which species do you find most threatening or difficult to work with and, and why. And we were surprised, not so much the species they chose, but the reasons for that species. So for example, they said the giraffe for them is their most neutral species, not beneficial, not harmful, but it helps them. It's seen as a species that helps them anticipate what's happening in the, in the landscape because birds patch on, 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 uh, on giraffes and on the trees giraffes are, are browsing on. And if a giraffe senses danger from far, its current movement helps the birds and other lower species respond. But here is what they said about the most dangerous. It's not the lion, it's not the elephant, it's the buffalo. They're not scared of the lion, they know how to avoid it. They're not scared of the lion, they know how to kill it. But the buffalo, they say, is temperamental and just destructive for no reason. You know, so so it was interesting to get these, you know, you they're, they're sort of qualitative, but they they help you appreciate how they deal with each species when it comes to conflict and uh, how they live on that space and coexist. And that same would go for trees and certain names of trees that they use maybe for graduating young men. And so that species for them is important in the landscape and they will do anything to conserve it. How can we tap into some of those stories and uses of their environment, even as we collect this data? And so I'm not sure whether the word would be anecdotal or and I, I believe they'd be so proud to feel that we are picking their stories as part of how we interpret the data. Um, and I don't know whether you can necessarily have a standard around that, but I think it would be good for Tadwick to consider in future, how do you bring this sort of, um, uh, you know, yeah, uh, nuances around date, the data we are collecting and how it relates to the people on the ground into our own databases. That's what comes to mind at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Hank, does that bring up ideas? Yeah, it does. It, it actually reminds me of a presentation that um, that was organized by uh, Idik Bio on the uh, traditional knowledge of the Maori people of New Zealand and how uh, we can create standards and tags, right, for incorporating uh, that knowledge and paying respect actually to the indigenous people in um, how we reference the importance of those objects or artifacts to those people. Um, it was a very, very moving uh, presentation. You know, I was um, hearing things that I hadn't even thought of. We think of things a particular way as scientists. And, you know, we come 
to the places where we work and we think we have all the answers. <laughs> just just uh, get out of our way and let us do our work, you know, and we'll, 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 we'll teach you something. But I, I've just learned so much about listening, listening to local people, getting their perspective, uh, you know, trying to understand how they see the world, you know, so they, in, in the kind of fish that I study, they see fish differently. They, you know, see fish as food, food sources. They see, you know, they, they understand about the, the importance of fish to ecosystem. They have, they actually have knowledge about, you know, how these fish, the roles that fish play in food webs and things like this, but not in the kind of, um, the kind of details that we think about it. So when we establish a dialogue with 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 local people, um, we engage them in the kind of work we're doing. We, you know, we educate them about our perspective, but they can also educate us about theirs. And it's so important to uh, to what we understand about to what we we what we take away um, in terms of knowledge about that community. It's not it's not all about collecting things and packaging them up and taking them back. To our countries and doing our work there, you know, we just benefit so much more when we engage the people, the local people, in the work that we're doing. Okay, so Deb, I we have three questions lined up in uh, in the platform. Lovely, Ellie. Let's hear them. So the first question is: um, uh, Could Lucy or Hank give us some ideas about how data portals such as GBIF might contribute to the decolonization of data? and how they might increase access to data already published. Maybe I'll start with this one, Lucy. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead, Hank. Yeah. So, you know, I think, well, first of all, GBIF is doing a wonderful job just making, you know, data on everything available. You know, when you think about how you can just carve out a little part of the world and uh, extract you know all the information that that's available from that 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 part of the world. This is a very powerful tool for anyone that's doing biodiversity science. It's also good for local and indigenous communities. You know, for them to have that ability to to access that data. The problem is access, right? It's do they have the right kind of internet connectivity? Do uh, they have the different kinds of tools that you know one would need in order to um, work with that data once the data are extracted? And you know, so so maybe there's an opportunity for GBIF to you know engage a little bit about um, how their information is being used in different countries. Just you know, look at who the users are, how much. I'm sure they keep statistics on um, who's extracting data from where and um, maybe look into how useful, um, maybe like sort of in the after, the after effects of those kind of searches, whether, whether those data are being published in any form or format. And, you know, maybe try to create a program around um, increasing not only just access to the data, but how those data are being used. Hmm. Follow up thoughts on that, Lucy? Yes, and, and really building on what Hank has uh, has uh, shared on on use. I think GIF's done a great job in availing what is possible to avail. I find some of our bottlenecks are at the two ends. One, the throughput of people putting in data is not as much as I would have thought by now. There doesn't seem to be enough. I don't know whether it's interest or understanding or capacity for people to to want to pull together data and, and provide it uh, to GBIF. Um, what's there is accessible, but I think the other end of that pipe is exactly what uh, Hank has talked about, its use. Um, and maybe it will take us back to the first question in our discussions with Alice. What are the questions people are asking and how can we help build the bridge to show them the potential of what the data GBIF has, which of course does need processing for different uses. How does that data contribute? It may not be all the data they need, but it can contribute to answering some, you know, as part of the pieces of answering the questions they have. Um, so maybe then they'll pay more attention and think, oh, okay, I have this question. Let me go to GBRIF and see what's there. So I think if we can improve on how to get more user, the user end uh, more diverse and also get more interest and incentive on the producer end 
to really know that their data matters. And if we don't have it, we can't use it. And how do we get them to, to really provide it in this very accessible platform? Hmm. Thank you. Um, Ali? So the next more? question is, um, so, so uh, I don't know if you've noticed that there's a, a feature in the Q&A, which is people can vote, that, so they can vote questions up. So uh, this question has been voted up to the top, um, which is how does digital, repa digital repatriation, so repatriation of the data, how does that measure up against claims to repatriate the objects or specimens themselves? Mm. Hang, go ahead on that. I'm not sure I understood it fully, but if you did, maybe you can take it. Yeah, but yeah. It. <laughs> thank you. I think I, I think I understand. Yeah, so digital repatriation is to create some digital, you know, analog or representation of an object, a cultural artifact or, or a specimen, a biodiversity specimen, and to make that available as opposed to uh, repatriating the actual specimen or object back to the country of origin. And, you know, I would say that um, the uh, digital uh, repatriation would be uh, okay as a starting point. Um, you know, if it's, if it's uh, an object uh, that can be recreated in three dimensions so that, you know, people can observe and appreciate it, uh, then that, that is a form, I think that's an important form of rep repatriation. Um, but I think that there's a big difference. So as a, I'm just going to use my field of, of fish biology. Um, there's lots of things that we can do with images of, um, of fish specimens, even 2D images. Um, if we had a 3D reconstruction of that specimen where we could count the scales and the fin rays and things, it's even better, right? But there's no substitute for holding that specimen in your hand and, you know, feeling it and observing it closely, you know, maybe you can, you can detect you can certainly detect details about it that our uh, computer images can't. Um, you know, that, that's the gold standard. I mean, to try to re repatriate the object itself back, back to the local community. In the absence of that, for whatever reason, um, a really good digital, um, digital object that people can observe and study uh, would, would, would just have to suffice. Here's another question. There's a big disconnect between urban and rural populations, but both have a stake in biodiversity and its, and its conservation. How do you bring these two groups, so the urban community and the rural community together and ensure that they work together? That might, might be one for you, Lucy. Yeah, I could take a stab at it as we begin. Um, I think the one thing is to is context again. If, you know, and I'm thinking of an example where there's been some work done by Conservation International in looking at water towers in one area and the use of that water by big industry 300 kilometers away. And big industries in an urban setting, but that water catchment um, and the ecosystem services it provides are, you know, 300 kilometers on some highland. Um, and the fact that the project was able to bring the different players to see the value of conserving that habitat and the water quality and the different um, uh, biodiversity that exists in the water because of all the functions it plays for all the users along the river. So it's not just important for the end big corporate 300 kilometers away who's producing various products and has huge water needs, or just for the community at the top of the mountain that's being told don't cut your trees, this is the water catchment. Everyone sees the value chain of the, of the data and information, whether in a rural setting or in an urban setting. And I think the more we can provide connectivity of context, so the urban person knows why the what's being conserved in a rural area matters to them in the city. Maybe it's growing their fruits or it's keeping bringing in their milk and why those in the rural areas 
need to care about what's happening, whether in terms of pollution or in terms of management of that space. And it's not so much a data question. I think it's a question of the, the interdependency of all of us and that the resources nature provides are needed by all of us at different stages and for different purposes. I feel in COVID that's become a, 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 a discussion that's possible because people are more aware of our interconnectedness with nature. But I think we can bring it to the biodiversity information uh, uh, space and, and start talking about the different uh, species people study. What uses are they to different people at different times? And, um, and see if that discussion can bring a better understanding of how much we depend on each other whether I live in the city and I can walk into a mall and buy what I want, or whether I really live in the rural area and I'm a farmer just trying to get a meal on the table for my children, why does that matter to the urban person? And why does the rural area matter? You know, and why does what's going on in the urban setting matter to the rural area? I think we, we can show more connectedness of the information we have and the different ways in which it affects or is usable in the different contexts. I think that's one piece, probably not the only one, but I've seen in this COVID period, people are more concerned about where their food comes from, what's happening here that's affected by elsewhere, and how do my actions here affect a different context that I'm not living in. Yeah. Wow, Lucy, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> we just have time for maybe one more short question. Um, we need to wrap this up and then maybe final thoughts from both of you. Before it's time. I'm afraid our questioners don't ask short questions. I they, uh, see that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I'll I'll um I'll pick the one that came in first by a minute, uh, okay. which is that de depositing specimens as in-country collections is a difficult topic. Kenya is an exception. So what what should we do in countries that don't have functional collections or uh, functional institutions that are able to properly care for those specimens uh, at the moment? Where, where do we put them? What do we do with them? Um, Hank, do you want to start with that one? Take it away, um, Hank. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to be brief. Yeah, it, it is a very sensitive topic um, because, you know, a lot of time and effort goes into collecting specimens. And there are lots of very goodwill efforts to deposit specimens in country, even a portion of the collected specimens in country so that they serve as some benefit. But if the institutions where those specimens are deposited can't care for them, uh, you know, doesn't have, if, they, if the people don't have the right kind of containers or cabinets, uh, for those specimens, then, you know, over time, the specimen is going to deteriorate and it, they're not going to be of any value to anyone. So, you know, I think we have to do is redouble our efforts to, you know, to help uh, countries to create the kinds of uh, institution of gov governments, agency of government, and uh, the resources. And it, this has to be a partnership, right? You have to provide the expertise on curatorial care of specimens you know, conditions of storage, uh, pro proper climate control, and things like this, so that the specimens are adequately cared for. Um, I'll say that, you know, if the specimens that are left in countries, even that don't have the resources to care for them, if those specimens make their way uh, into the hands of uh, training students that are in training so that they can study them, you know, then then there's knowledge that's being gained from access to those specimens. But I think what we have to do is form partnerships so that um, there's both uh, opportunities to learn about proper care of specimens, proper kinds of facilities for care, taking care of those specimens, and um, training happens at the same time so that you know the knowledge that's in that material gets extracted and is a benefit to the community. Thank you, Hank. Lucy? Would you like to add to that? I probably don't have anything else to add. I think Hank has covered it comprehensively. Thank you, Hank. Okay. Yes, thank you. So we have time for both of you with a quick final thought on our topics today. Hmm. Um, sorry, I had written some notes here. Let me just pick. Sure. See if there's anything. Um, but I think the one thing I, I wanted to perhaps just 
remind us all in Tadwick, this is you know, something that's been close to Tadwick's heart and just to emphasize again, the importance of capacity building. We still really do not have adequate capacity on data science um, at different levels. Whether it's a policy level or the people managing and manipulating data or the people who need the information. I think we need to broaden the scope of how many people understand uh, data science, even though they may not all be high-end practitioners. But the more I, I listen to the conservation challenges we have today in Kenya, um, a lot, I wouldn't say we can solve the problems better, but we can have a better grasp of where our priorities would be if we really had, you know, prioritized pulling information together, dialoguing around what that information says, uh, working together in providing, you know, platforms to integrate this information. So I think there's still much that can be done on capacity. And that for me is still, is something I'd like to say as we start the conference this early on. And I know it's something Tadwick has supported over the years, but to say we still can continue doing so and see how many more partners we can bring on board to help us uh, push that further along. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you. Hank, your final thoughts? Yes, first of all, I just wanna say how great it is to uh, be on a panel with Lucy Warwinki, who um, I, you know, I agree with everything she says, every, you know, every word that she utters, just perfect capacity building, you know, first and foremost, uh, we have to pay a lot more attention to that. Uh, the other thing I'll add is uh, something that we, we talked about um, when, when Alice was speaking was connectivity. So, you know, we have lots of disconnected data. Uh, we have lots of data, but they're not connected in ways that they're beneficial to us for understanding, you know, the impact, like I was mentioning, of dams on, you know, in, in, the, in the headwaters of, of rivers on uh, areas downstream where people, where people's livelihoods or base, you know, how do we, how do we connect the data so that uh, they benefit uh, local and indigenous people and their livelihoods? I think we, I think there's a lot of work uh, to be done there as well. And some of that work is is capacity building. You know, how do those people participate in the process of understanding the impact of the things that we're doing to the landscape on their livelihoods? I think there's a lot of a lot of opportunity um, for um, extending, if you will, um, the knowledge that you know is that can be derived from all of this information. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I just think that um, if we if the effort that we put into connecting these disparate data sets are going to pay uh, big benefits in in how we understand. And, and make you know our uh, our time on this earth more sustainable and not so harmful to the planet. Well, on that note, I'd like to say thank you very much to both of you for joining us today and, and sharing your insights and hope that I can entice you to take on the questions that are left in the question and answer section that we did not get to uh, because this session can be viewed again by others who weren't able to join us right now and they can come back and we can all see uh, your answers and input and, and look forward to seeing you at other sessions here this week and potential future collaborations on some of these large topics of connectivity and capacity building that you've uh, both raised. Thank you very much for this conversation. Thanks from everybody. Can you uh, <laughs> clap in the chat and, and with the emojis and uh, let them know how much we appreciate the, their time today. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye. With that, I'd like to jump into the logistics to get us started uh, with the, the next part of our meeting today. And just please confirm for me that you're seeing my opening slide, yes? Yes, we can see it. Yay. <laughs> so, welcome to Tadwick. Um, it is, as Hank has said in the past, the Biodiversity Standards Conference of the Year. And we want to say thank you for joining us. And to please let your colleagues know via 
all the social media that you can manage. Uh, again, the communication uh, efforts that uh, Lucy alluded to, as, as well as Alice, um, what we're doing here and, and why, we're, why we're doing it. So it would be great if we could be together in person. However, being together here is also lovely. Um, as you can see, it has allowed us to have almost 400 people register from over 46 countries. Uh, and that includes 39 students and, and 31 postdocs that Ellie alluded to earlier, uh, that our audience includes a lot of early career uh, people. So welcome. With this slide, it's just a, a quick insights in uh, generating a word cloud using the symposium abstracts. So you can see here, we are a community of people interested in biodiversity data and the standards needed in order to make that data useful to as many people as we can for all the reasons we heard uh, this morning already. So the engagement of all these different groups, uh, all these different countries across the world um, would not be possible without the support we've received from these organizations, from the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, from the World Wildlife Fund, the Atlas of Living Australia, from DISCO, the Distributed System of Scientific Collections, uh, Pensoft that publishes our conference proceedings in the Biodiversity Information Science and Standards Journal, PICTRI, the University uh, of Florida, uh, the Research, the Biodiversity Institute, and the Florida Museum, as well as IDIG Bio, Natural Solutions, and the Biodiversity Heritage Library. So these are, uh, it's a two-way street here, right? We all benefit um, and our community benefits from their support, but we all have an opportunity here uh, to look for the synergy in our local missions, our personal spheres uh, with the missions of these different groups. And one example would be the Russell Train Fellowship offered by the World Wildlife Fund. So if you're looking for a conservation fellowship and you can incorporate your knowledge of what you learn about TADWIG and standards development and bring that to your work, um, that's one way in which our synergy um, builds on the, crossing the missions of all these different organizations. So all of you will have noticed uh, that there is uh, the Whova conference platform, and we hope that you're finding it useful, again, for building community. So even though we can't be together in the same room, um, you have the ability to watch sessions now and up to six months from now and to converse with attendees. Um, you can go into the agenda right now, um, check out all the different sessions. You can talk with the attendees uh, into the community. You can ask the organizers anything. Uh, you can even set up uh, meetups, virtual meetups. So if you wanted to chat after this session, with some people you've been talking with in the chat, you can go and set up your own meet right inside the conference platform. Um, under the resources, uh, you'll find more materials. You can look at the different questions that have been asked across uh, different uh, sessions and all in one place, as well as things like polls that have been uh, posed looking for your input. We are all currently dealing with COVID which is one of the reasons why we're gathering this way, right? But at the same time, again, gathering this way has meant uh, we can share our own local to global experiences in a way that um, gives us some dimensions um, that aren't necessarily possible if it were only in person. If this is your first time to join us, for Biodiversity Information Standards, TADWIG. Thank you. Uh, we're excited that you are here. And we have a video for you that we would encourage you to watch. And in that video at YouTube, if you click show more, you'll get this lovely table of contents on the right. 
And if you look closely, you'll see some names here that you probably already recognize. Um, here's Ellie Wallace. <laughs> and you'll get to meet many of the people that you're going to see uh, in different sessions uh, during the week. But this will give you a great overview about who Tadwig is, what we do, how Tadwig works. So we, we encourage you um, to watch this video. There are a few social events for uh, getting to know each other and uh, expanding our reach across the planet. And this one is going on right now. It started on uh, Friday, I believe, and goes in through next Sunday. So using the iNaturalist app, you can join the worldwide BioBlitz from your neighborhood and share with us what's in your area. We would love to see that and we can add to the world's knowledge about biodiversity at the same time while we're talking about the standards that we need in order to share that data. Um, find VJ in the conference app uh, or on Twitter if you'd like to know more. You might have the answer. Join the pub quiz, see if you do. Um, you notice here, this is in my local time. If you're interested in the pub quiz, it's tomorrow. It's at 2230 UTC, which you can tell when it is in my time zone. Uh, and if you've got questions, um, find Kimberly Cook in the conference website. You can send her a message. On Friday, closing our conference, we have Radio Tadwig 2021, hosted by DJ Demi. Dimitri Brosens will be taking requests right now in the conference app. It's very cool. You can go in, find this event, which again is on Friday in the agenda inside the conference app. And there you'll find a link to this Google form right here. And you'll be able to make requests and dedications for what songs you'd like to hear. Um, looking forward to that. Posters Plus is a new feature inside this conference platform. We were excited to try it. Uh, if you currently go and look, you'll see there are 17 posters in there. You can start looking at them right now. Some of you already have. You can comment, talk to the authors of those posters, ask them questions. Uh, they get notified. Like they know that there's a message in there for them and they respond. So you can already have conversations around those posters. Some of them have included videos. Um, so pop on over to Posters Plus. There's another feature inside Posters Plus that we want to try, which is wild ideas. So you can use this to pitch your wild idea for biodiversity information, science, and standards. Um, if you have one that you'd like to share and start a conversation around, uh, send an email to avery.bender at ufl.edu and she'll fill out a stub entry for you and then you'll be able to go in and edit that entry for your wild idea and start a conversation around it. Look forward to seeing you um, and all of us at the poster session as well, um, but keep in mind we can all visit the posters right away. Perhaps you have questions already. We have a session specifically set up for you to ask us questions. So tomorrow at 20 UTC, uh, there'll be a group of us ready and waiting. And VJ will be moderating. Thanks, VJ. And again, if this is your first time to join us, if you watch this video first, it may answer some of your questions and it will give you more to ask, I'm sure. So some of you may be wondering who organized this, um, how did it come to be? And there are so many to thank. I think it would look like movie credits that run for about five minutes. So this is the quick version. Uh, the local organizers and those of you who were able to join us uh, as of 8 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time will have heard from Pam Soltis 
Uh, she's the director of the University of Florida Biodiversity Institute and is the research PI for iDigBio. Um, the University of Florida Conference Services, uh, they are here with us right now, helping us with all the technical details of running this meeting. Uh, and they have managed registration. Thank you very much. And that's Avery, Lauren, Kevin, Sienna, and Katie. They're here for us all week. The program committee, uh, you, those of you who were brave and you put your hand up and you filled out the form and signed up to be part of the program committee, the people you see here are the ones responsible uh, for putting together the program that you are enjoying this week. And we cannot thank them enough. Please, when you meet them and you see them in the chat and in the meeting, um, take a moment to say thank you. The steering committee uh, is a some of the executive committee of Tadwig, um, and then including local hosts, Pamela Soltis, as well as Avery Bender from the conference services team. And together, we've coordinated across all of these groups um, to bring you this meeting along with all the session organizers and moderators without whom we wouldn't have sessions, uh, as well as the people who said yes when we asked for some additional help. Many, many thanks. For those of you who would like to learn a little bit more about the program committee, uh, at this link here, you can see uh, a detailed page of uh, who each person is, uh, where they're from, a little bit about what they do. They are from all over the world and represent many different directions uh, of science and interest in, in data, from generating the data to building the kinds of bridges and connectivity between IT and research and community, uh, between people who work with R, between people who are um, interested in diversity and inclusion and people who are uh, interested in particular areas of science, be they botanists, entomologists, et cetera. So they, are, they represent a wide variety of interests and directions. As to what Tadwig does all year in between conferences, uh, we are an organization made up of interest and task groups. We take on many different topics surrounding data standard needs. On this slide, you get a very quick overview of some of them, not all of them. Just give you a moment to read the list, which I'm doing too. So some of you are very familiar with those groups, but for others, those may be new to you. We'd like to say uh, a special thanks to the organizers of the November meeting coming up um, around the interests and task groups. And the organizers of that include members of the Tadwick Executive, uh, Holly, Patricia, Takeru, Visitari, and Paula. Thank you to them for organizing opportunities for all of us to join these groups in November uh, for online sessions to learn more about what they do uh, and give us an opportunity to engage in that work. So during this week, you'll see a, an opportunity to register. It will be free for all the sessions, but registration will be required. Um, and if you have questions, please find the organizers and uh, ask them. This is one example uh, when you're wondering what these groups do. Uh, the, the Darwin Core Maintenance Group uh, takes on the challenge of the Darwin Core Standard for sharing biodiversity information uh, occurrence data. And uh, occasionally a term that we use might need a definition to be updated or a new example, or maybe there's a new term that someone needs because they have information to share, but they have no bucket to put it in. And so here every six months, the, the terms are reviewed and the community puts in requests. I need a new term. I need a term to be updated, please. 
And then there's lots of evaluation and discussion about the, the actual demand for that. Is it sustainable? Um, does it fit within what we want to accomplish? And then it, all this information goes out for public review. If consensus is reached, and then the Tadwig Executive Committee um, says thank you very much and adopts uh, the recommended changes. So with the links here, and again, all of these will be shared, uh, you can look at the last six month review um, and a webinar that we did uh, to talk about this entire process. You can watch and see how that's done. So this is just one example of how we do our work. For those of you who are looking to serve in a leadership role, we have openings for you. Uh, the openings of treasurer, uh, infrastructure, the technical architecture group, fundraising and partnerships uh, as the kind that we brought to you earlier by showing you who our supporters are, gives you an example of the work being done. Um, the time and place chair, where is Tadwick going to be in the future? As well as regional representation um, for Latin America and Oceania. If you think one of these would be a way in which you could serve in a leadership role, uh, note here and you can find out more. And again, I think you heard enough this morning to know you see this need for bridging gaps in communities. And you can be a part of that by bringing your expertise in, and you're part of the puzzle. Uh, to the Tadwick Executive. If you like the idea of organizing meetings and, and bringing vision to the structure, uh, we'll have a call going out after Tadwick 2021 uh, to help build 2022. So please consider uh, saying yes and signing up for that. And now for the good stuff. Tadwick 2021 begins and We've had a lovely plenary, and we'll start off with connecting biodiversity data with knowledge graphs. Thanks, everyone. A special thanks to the Tadwig 2021 Executive Committee and everyone who has made this event possible and is participating. Um, thank you. <laughs>